This video is sponsored by Voxlink, a new social media app designed by gamers for gamers, where you can find events and players in your area. More about them later on in the video. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and it's been a couple weeks since the release of the 10th edition Tyranid Codex. We have a pretty good handle on it, the most effective strategies with it, and how to play each of the detachments available within it. So that's what I want to talk about today, is do a holistic deep dive into the entirety of the 10th edition Tyranid Codex. What we're going to be talking about today are some overviews of the faction and its faction mechanics, the strengths, weaknesses, and general game plan of the faction, some important units to look at when constructing your Tyranid army and how to play them on the tabletop, as well as a brief overview of the mechanics and most important combinations and units for each of the detachments available to Tyranids. Now, for a couple caveats before we get into it, at the time of recording, we are under the auspices of the autumn 2023 balance data slate so things might change in the future but my hope is that unless the fashion goes through some very hefty rebalances or redesigns this will still be useful moving on into the future i'm also in this video going to be talking about the most common ways to play the faction and the most successful army archetypes that we've seen at tyranid players put up in competitive play however the faction is relatively deep so this video isn't going to go into every possible combination of tyranid armies that would take a it would take a very long time so there are other ways to create and construct your Tyranid build. This is mostly just to give a player a baseline of what to expect and where to go if they're just jumping into Tyranids. On top of that, in preparation for all my Tyranid content, I played dozens of games with the new Codex. A lot of those are available over on my second channel if you want to watch gameplay of the Codex, and I'm going to be using footage from those as well as footage from games that I live streamed at recent tournaments and commentated on from some of the best Tyranid players in the world. In addition, I'm probably going to also jump into Tabletop Simulator to showcase some of the tactics that you can use when playing the faction. And so with that, let's dive in. Let's talk about the Tyranid Codex and let's get gribbly with it. <laughs> but first, a little bit of a word from our sponsor, Voxlink. This video is brought to you by Voxlink. And if you've been watching this channel for a little while, you know that I presented Voxlink to you in the past. And with the help of everyone who watched those videos and jumped on the original Voxlink Kickstarter, that was actually fully funded and is now available for use. This is a social media app for gamers by gamers. And right now it gives you the option to browse a wide variety of gaming content. You can see things like painting tutorials, battle reports about a wide variety of miniatures games that you select when you register for the app. I especially appreciate that it has a news feed for specific games that you can sign up for so you can see new news, community posts, and upcoming events for these games that you are specifically interested in. You can even then show off your own models to the community and get stuck in with some interesting discussions surrounding your favorite miniature games all within Voxlink. Not only that, but you can also browse creators in specific categories. So if you want to see videos specifically about the games that you're interested in, you can see which creators are currently active active within those games. Even it's yours truly. I'm right here. I only have four likes though. So let's get on in there and bump those rookie numbers up. We got to beat Zorpa Zorp. So please download the app from the iOS or app store. Go to that creator section, hit the little heart button next to Tactical Tortoise, and then also avail yourself of all of the other exciting features. What Voxlink is trying to create is not only a social media app, but also have the functionality to register for events and find players in your area. This is an absolutely invaluable resource for both new and returning players to the hobby. And the best way to get the word out is to join on. So go hop onto it in the iOS and Android store, and I'll see you on the Vox link. The Tyranid faction has two core army abilities in 10th edition. The first one is Synapse. This represents the mental control that the smarter, more or highly evolved Tyranid creatures have over the smaller, less important ones. In 10th edition, this gives you an additional D6 on your battle shock checks for units within six inches of Synapse models. Now, this is a little bit confusing because as you'll look through the Codex, basically every model in Tyranids has the Synapse ability. The Synapse ability is what allows you to receive the benefit from Synapse units, 
What makes a unit a Synapse unit? It is the keyword found at the bottom of their data sheet. So while it looks like every unit in the codex has Synapse, only the ones with the keyword actually project the aura that affects your Battleshock checks. Now, important to note that this is only Battleshock checks. It doesn't affect all leadership checks. And so if there are mechanics that your opponent has that forces leadership checks on you, for example, those would not be buffed by Synapse. Now that said, this ability is very powerful when it comes to cementing your control over objectives. An extra D6 on a Battleshock check actually makes it's Tyranids, one of the most leadership agnostic armies in the game. It is very difficult to Battleshock Tyranid units as long as your Synapse network is supported. Now, it is only a six inch bubble, but there are some units in the faction that increases it. Some characters like Swarmlord have a larger Synapse range, and there are upgrades to enhance your Synapse range as well. In addition to that, units like the Nero Tyrant can also apply Synapse to things outside of the normal Synapse range. That ability comes into play in your command phase, which is before your or Battleshock step of your turn, meaning that you can apply it to units who are gonna be taking a Battleshock test later on in the phase, give them that extra D6 from being now in synapse range. This ability is actually pretty good. And as we see more Battleshock Matters abilities in other factions, it is just gonna get more powerful. Now, Tyranids are very much of a theme of being the Battleshock faction. Shadow in the Warp is the other army ability, and that really follows this trend. Once per game, as long as you have a unit with Shadow in the Warp, which is generally speaking, your synaptic characters. So things like the Nero Tyrant and Hive Tyrants, most Tyranid armies will be including one or both of those, which means you'll have access to a Shadow in the Warp. That says if they die before you use the ability, it actually does go away. They have to be on the battlefield, so not in reserve and not destroyed. So you do have to use it or lose it. When you use Shadow in the Warp, it happens in either player's command phase and forces a Battleshock check on every single enemy unit on the battlefield. Importantly, this means it does not affect enemy units that are in reserve or otherwise not on the battlefield. So there are some instances where your component can try to dodge Shadow in the Warp. However, it cannot be affected by the Insane Bravery Stratagem because, importantly, it is not in the Battleshock step of their command phase, which makes it more powerful than other Battleshock causing abilities in 40k. Hilariously, this makes Tyranids actually kind of difficult to affect with other Shadows in the Warp because oftentimes they will be in their own Synapse aura. So that's kind of funny. But on top of that, using your Shadow in the Warp at the most effective time is one of the big skills to playing Tyranids. What you want to do is use it at the start of your opponent's turn. Oftentimes their Battle Round 2 or Battle Round 3 because using it at the start of their turn disrupts their scoring and then causes them to be battle shocked through your next turn. This squad here. Uh oh. Uh, I could see if you rerolled those, correct? Nope. Can't reroll Battleshock chests. There are some instances where, for example, where, for example, you want to turn off enemy defensive stratagems on units or abilities that require them not to be Battleshocked, where you use it in your own command phase. However, the thing to keep in mind when you do that is that the Battleshock will wear off at the start of the opponent's next turn. So if you use it in your own turn, it only lasts for one turn. Whereas if it, you use it in their turn, it affects their scoring and impacts them for a full battle round. So while you get a little bit more control when you use it on your own turn, the most effective use of it is when you use it in your opponent's turn. So those are the core mechanics of the faction. Let's talk about some generic strengths and weaknesses of the army. Their control of Battleshock is definitely one of the big strengths of the army. They're able to reduce enemy OC and disrupt their stratagem usage over the course of the game using effects like Shadow in the Warp and also units like Nero Lictors or the Death Leaper. On top of that, they also have incredible objective scoring. They have fairly resilient units that can brawl in the center of the table and score very quickly on primary objectives, and they have some of the best secondary objective scoring in the game, with units like Biovores and Ripper Swarms able to deep strike models around the table. Supporting that, they also have very, very strong chaff infantry. Units like Gargoyles and Termagants are cheap, fast, high objective control and are good for, again, scoring those secondary objectives, but also disrupting your opponent on primary. They also have some pretty decent mid-range shooting. Their shooting is not long range. It's largely within the 18 to 24 inch range band, which is extremely short in Warhammer 40K, but it's very efficient and their most effective shooting units are extremely cheap. Now, there are some weaknesses to go on top of that. The first one is that that efficient shooting does come at the cost of having relatively poor punching power, especially against high 
toughness enemies. Tyranid attacks usually cap out at around strength 10, and with heavy tanks and things like that being toughness 11 or 12, that means that Tyranids will oftentimes be wounding things on fives and have to rely on effects like lethal hits, twin linked for wound rerolls or plus one to wound effects to get around the hump of dealing that damage. The can makes Tyranids damage output pretty inconsistent, which can be frustrating for the faction, but they do have some combos that get around that. That said, in order to secure this damage output, they have to be relatively combo oriented. So they need to build sort of a Rube Goldberg machine oftentimes in order to get the maximum damage from many of their units, which requires several units or abilities to get to the same level of damage output that other factions have naturally. They do have that focus on battle shock, which can be very powerful against low leadership armies, but against high leadership armies it means a lot of their abilities don't actually trigger. Now with all those pros and cons and army abilities, what are Tyranids actually trying to do on the tabletop? <laughs> The general faction game plan that most armies that you see played competitively for Tyranids falls into is using resilient units like monsters or chaff infantry units to brawl over the midboard of the table. They have a lot of units like Haru Spexes and Maliceptors that are relatively efficient and resilient and can force your opponent to deal with them while hanging out in objectives across the center of the table and scoring primary until your opponent actually comes to contest with them. Again, Tyranids shooting is relatively effective, but short range, so all you want your opponent to do is kind of funnel in to those resilient monsters that are sitting in the center of the table and then counterpunch them. Tyranids then use fast units like gargoyles and battle shock effects like shadow in the warp to keep the opponent off balance on their own objectives. You can use these fast units to out objective control them on their own objectives, keep their primary objective score low while your own monsters are scoring a ton of points yourself, and you have naturally good secondary objective scoring with cheap utility units like Spore mines from biovores and ripper swarms. Once it comes to killing enemies, you want to combo together your ranged attacks with stratagems that buff your output, the offensive buff from the Neurolictor, removing cover from pyrovores, rerolls from exocrines. Put those all together to get lots of damage out of your hitter units. Units like Maliceptors or Zonethropes have pretty effective ranged attacks by themselves, and once comboed out, can do insane damage. Now I've touched on a lot of these individual units, so let's talk about them specifically. These are units that you're gonna be seeing in basically every Tyranid army, and these are ones that I would, if you're constructing a Tyranid army, always consider including. The first one is gonna be the Gargoyle. This is probably the backbone of the Tyranid objective scoring game plan. These guys are incredibly fast. They have assault weapons, which allows them to advance, perform actions, and still shoot their guns. On top of that, they can also move after shooting. The amount of utility that this unit has with its ability to move after shooting is absolutely insane, and I'll give you some examples here. Gargoyle's insane speed is incredibly effective for a lot of reasons. Obviously, the biggest thing you can do with their ability to move after shooting is, is to move out, make attacks against enemies that you can see, and then move back. You can potentially get some damage output while remaining out of line of sight and safe from your opponent. But the most exciting part about it is its ability to actually move them forward. So you can take a gargoyle unit like this, advance them an average of three inches, 3.5 on a single D6. Let's move them somewhere around 16 inches. Now, what we wanna do is prevent these space marines from getting over to our side of the table and mucking stuff up so we can shoot. All you need is a single gargoyle to attack because uh, you do need to resolve the unit's attacks in order to trigger their ability to move again, but you don't need the entire unit to attack. You just need a single model. Once you do that, we'll just shoot this rhino. We can move the gargoyles another six inches. Obviously you can't get into engagement range of enemies, but what we can do is prevent the area where the space marine player would be disembarking from this rhino. So we can potentially surround it with these gargoyles and we can even perform some move blocks onto these Terminators. The Terminators are relatively slow. They're not really able to move around very far. Uh, and especially with a lot of factions with their ability to advance and charge, they can potentially be moving pretty far up the table and charging our more valuable units who could be holding the objectives down in the center. If we say there's an objective in the middle here with a Maliceptor on it or something, we don't want the Assault Terminators to touch it. So the Gargoyles will physically interpose themselves and prevent the Terminators from moving farther than this wall. Now, in addition, all of these effects that allow units to move after shooting 
uh, are actually usable when they come out of reserve. The unit can't move farther in the movement phase if they deep strike on the table, but they're still able to move in the shooting phase. And this is incredibly useful for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is getting objectives. So for example, if we have a situation here where uh, we're in our opponent's deployment zone, they've got a vehicle on the objective that's screening us out from deep striking onto it, or even a little bit too close here. We've drawn capture enemy outpost, so we have to control their objective in order to score it. What we can do is just deep strike the gargoyles nine inches away from enemies as normal, then shoot at that enemy unit and again, move six inches and just put a couple gargoyles on that objective in order to steal it. So you have to be super careful if you're playing against gargoyles. You have to screen units from being able to place six inches away from the objective, because if you don't do that, they can drop in, shoot, move six inches, and then stand on the objective. So if you're if you're only blocking off the objective on one side or another of it, these gargoyles are gonna be able to move up and touch it. Now on top of that, this can also be used to move them into positions for maneuver secondaries, things like behind enemy lines and engage in all fronts. If we need to be in a particular area, you know, three inches past this table quarter, for example, we can be deep striking even if your opponent is screening, then uh, making those range attacks and moving the unit after they've deep struck in order to move them into a table quarter or into your opponent's deployment zone. Now, the one thing that they can't do is perform this move and also do actions at the same time because uh, you can't shoot and perform actions like cleanse or deploy teleport homers. But the fact that their weapons are assault means that if the gargoyles are already on the table, they're gonna be able to advance and do those actions anyway. So they're even still pretty good at doing them even if they can't actually uh, use their full maneuverability while doing so. Gargoyles are a little bit of a silver bullet in a lot of situations. They can shut down melee armies by preventing them from moving effectively. If you have several units of gargoyles that you can sort of throw out in waves to try to stop them from touching your more important units, that is super duper tough for melee armies to stop or deal with. And they're incredibly strong at stealing objectives. Even just moving, shooting, and then moving again to get a long distance to touch enemy objectives is already super duper. Super good. So while gargoyles are your primary disruption piece, neurolictors are another important piece of the puzzle. These guys are single lone operative infiltrators that force battle shock checks on enemies in your own command phase 12 inches away from them and can support the rest of your army's damage output by giving you plus one to wound against battle shocked enemies. They also give battle shocked enemies minus one to hit. That's less important. That plus one to wound is really the name of the game. Now these guys are resilient, hard to pin down, and pretty cost effective, probably one of the strongest lone operative units in the entire game, and their interaction with the rest of the Tyranid gunline, which tends to be kind of mid to low strength ranged attacks that then get buffed by the Neurolictor Aura is very, very valuable. That said, you do have to know how to use them on the table to get the most effectiveness out of them. Now, playing with Neurolictors and understanding how uh, Neurolictors work is one of the fundamental principles of the 10th edition Tyranid Codex, because they're probably one of the most important units in the Codex, not only for their ability to disrupt scoring, but also to buff your own army. Now, one mistake I see players make a lot of times is trying to aggressively use their Neurolectors to get onto enemies. Because their ability triggers in your command phase, you don't have much control over when your opponent walks into it. And oftentimes you'll find your opponent will just stay, you know, 12.01 inches away from the Neurolectors. So the point is to put them in positions where your opponent doesn't want to not get in range. So for example, what we want to be doing is placing our Neurolictors so that they are 12 inches away, at least you know during deployment, from the back of these objective markers. That means that if your opponent is going to come touch the objective marker, they're automatically within the aura of the Neurolictor. In addition, you can also place them in particularly advantageous positions for your opponent. For example, if we place them so that their 12-inch aura encompasses the back of this terrain feature, if your opponent deploys up and then moves by behind that terrain feature, the Neurolictor's automatically then gonna be forcing battle shock checks on them. The objective control capacity of the Neurolictors is the, the real big one. Oftentimes, especially for middle objectives, and if your opponent is gonna be trying to move aggressively up to you, you can put two or even three Neurolictors with that aura in range of the objective and then force multiple battle shock checks on them if they move up to touch it, which means that your opponent is kind of not incentivized to move to that objective, so they're not even gonna be trying to score those points. And that's already kind of money in the bank for you without even doing anything. You're, you're, the Neurolectors just sort of force your opponent to play more passively just by virtue of the fact that it exists. 
In addition, the Neural Electors also just good for scoring objectives because, uh, you know, they can do actions, they can cleanse objectives and stuff like that. Having Neural Electors around each objective is usually pretty good. And I've also found that it's, it's useful to have one of them at least towards the middle or late game, uh, if your opponent is moving up to them and they're in danger, in reserve, uh, not literally in reserve, but hanging out in your deployment zone so that uh, if you find that one of your opponent's units has become naturally battle shocked, you can then run the Neurolictor out and get its aura onto other people. Don't think about the Neurolictor as only working when its effect battle shocks people. It also applies to any unit that's battle shocked from any source. So if you have units like Screamer Killers, for example, that force battle shock checks on your opponent when they shoot at them, or if they're just taking battle shock checks because they're below uh, half starting strength, or you have Shadow in the Warp battle shocking them, all of those instances are still going to be triggering the, the plus one to wound against that unit for the Neuroelector being nearby. So you want to have the Neuroelectors in a position where if your opponent's important units, their frontline units, are battle shocked for any reason, you can get a Neuroelector up in range and then benefit from its auras. So the, the power of the Neuroelector is twofold. What you want to be doing is making it so when your opponent comes in to fight the, the toilet bowl, I like to call it, where the, the game sort of swirls around the middle and you have units like Noran Emissaries or Maliceptors tanking out that middle objective, the Neuroelectors will just be forcing passive battle shock checks that whole time. And then if any of those are failed, you need a Neuroelector to run in and give your army the buff against them. So I wouldn't be placing Neuroelectors sort of at the front of your deployment zone up aggressively. I find that typically Neuroelectors Neuroelectors oftentimes will simply sit in my deployment zone or one or two inches outside my deployment zone in a position where it's tough to get a grips on them and they can be forcing those battle shock checks on enemies that move up in the front of the table here. It's also important to keep in mind your opponent's threat ranges when you're talking about these Neuroelectors. Uh, it is easy to, to sort of think of lone operative as being immune to ranged attacks, but that's not really how it works. So uh, make sure that you know where your opponent places their models, you're just going to be their movement plus 12 inches away wherever you place the Neuroelectors um, if they are are in a position where you can place them where you're uh, trying to place them defensively, then there's just no way that your opponent can get into range of them. Once you unlock the secrets of the Neurolector, though, uh, the Tyranid faction sort of opens up in a big way because Neurolectors are so incredibly powerful. Moving on, I've talked about the resilience of Tyranid monsters previously, and the Maliceptor is sort of the poster child for that stat line. These guys are high toughness, high and vulnerable save brawlers. They project an aura of minus one to be hit and potentially wounded six inches away from them, which affects enemy units, not friendly units, meaning that once they get an enemy unit in range, it's going to affect all of that enemy unit's attacks, regardless of whether they're attacking the Maliceptor or not. This gives you a big high resilience unit with a strong short ranged attack, as well as pretty solid melee attacks that can sink into even some of the strongest enemy melee units in the game, tie them up round after round, not really take too much damage and slowly attrition them to death. For their defensive profile, Maliceptors are not too expensive, and they're really going to be one of the most important frontline units that the Tyranid faction has access to. A lot of Tyranid armies are constructed around two or three Maliceptors standing in the front of the army to absorb enemy attacks, neutralize the most effective enemy units, and continuously pump out damage with their own ranged attacks. Now, to help future-proof this video a little bit, I think that it is possible in future patches that the place of the Maliceptor gets taken by other units. There are similar defensive profiles in the faction elsewhere. Things like Hyra Duels and Norn Emissaries are both high save, high toughness, big wound count monsters that want to take the center of the table and dominate it. If we do see changes to the Maliceptor in future updates, I could see its role being taken by units like that. They also have some other very important units that support them. The most important one is the Exocrine. Exocrines are some of the most efficient ranged attacks that you get in the Tyranid faction. For very low points value, you get a pretty resilient monster with a 36 inch range, strength 8, AP 3, 3 damage ranged attack. That strength value is low, but again, against heavy, high toughness targets, we're going to be trying to combo off some additional damage from effects like lethal hits, from stratagems, or from again, 
the Neurolictor Aura for plus one to wound. Once those effects are applied, Exocrines can put extremely efficient damage downrange. On top of that, their weapon is heavy, so when they stand still, they hit on twos, and they are part of the damage combo that Tyranids want to be assembling, because once one Exocrine hits a target, all other ranged attacks for that phase against that target get reroll once they hit, just cementing the reliability of the Tyranid gun line. Now, while Exocrines aren't the easiest unit in the game to kill, they are significantly squishier than their hardier frontline units, things like Maliceptors. So setting up your Exocrine in uh, the most opportune position to make use of it in the later game is very important. One thing that you're going to want to do typically is that uh, the turn that you move out, which is oftentimes like top of round two, bottom of round one, where you start pushing your larger models like your Maliceptors into the center of the table to take control of primary, like we've talked about previously, but your opponent's focus is going to be drawn to those big heavy hitters. And while they are harder to kill than the Exocrine, they are uh, obviously a, a more immediate threat than the Exocrines will be. And very few armies, I would say almost no armies in the game, have the ability to, to in one turn, contend with the Maliceptors in the front of their army and also Exocrines sitting in your back line. So the turn that you're pushing out, oftentimes what you're going to want to do is start moving your Exocrines, uh, even if they don't have any targets, you can move them with advances along the sides of the table to control these lines of fire. And that allows you to get shots across most of the objectives and respond to any enemies that are attacking your Maliceptors. The big benefit that the Exocrine has in this situation is that it does have that heavy keyword. So once the Exocrine is in position, your opponent you know, pops out of their own line of sight blockers and starts to try to deal with the Maliceptors. Maybe they start to kill them. Maybe they start to, to deal significant damage to them. At that point, your Exocrine's in a position to respond and it can remain stationary, meaning that it's hitting on twos rather than threes. And if you have multiple Exocrines both syncing up attacks on a single enemy target, there's suddenly the second one anyway, is going to be hitting on twos, re-rolling ones, which is incredibly efficient, and especially once you combine it with some other buff effects, things like re-roll ones to wound from the Synaptic Nexus stratagem, lethal hits or sustained hits from invasion force or even just a, a Neurolictor's plus one to wound that gets actually extremely efficient for the low points cost of the Exocrine. Opponent now, they could potentially uh, use their long range, you know, firepower to start to start to try to deal with the Exocrines, but those are attacks that are typically not going into your Maliceptors. And those are the kind of things that your Maliceptors don't really want to get hit by. So you're basically threat saturating your opponent on that turn, whether your Maliceptors are pushing forward. And if they don't deal with the Maliceptors, the Maliceptors are going to start scoring primary points. The Exocrines are a lot less of a scoring threat. They're more of an attritional threat, which means your opponent's probably going to try to deal with the Maliceptors first. Now, the other thing to think about when it's when you're uh, considering getting shots with your Exocrines is the Hive Tyrant aura. The Hive Tyrant projects an aura that gives weapons assault, so the ability to fire after advancing. And that is super powerful on a unit like an Exocrine, because they have this long range, being able to advance them laterally, if you need to do so in order to get line of sight, that's certainly something you should consider. Allow your Exocrines to do things like move far laterally to get cheeky lines of sight that your opponent might not be expecting. So if you can, for example, you know, get an Exocrine over here, get a Hive Tyrant within six inches of it, and start to get a line of sight around this building, for example, you start to be able to control lanes of fire that your opponent didn't expect with what is normally a big, slow ranged attacker. And the Exocrines are so excellent at killing infantry, especially things like medium and heavy infantry that have good armor saves and a bunch of wounds. The Exocrines are low strength, so not very good against tanks, but high AP, high damage, which means they're very good against those, you know, heavily armored infantry units, things like Hellblasters or Aggressors, if you're able to use that Assault Aura to get the Exocrine line of sight around a corner into a position your opponent wouldn't expect, triggering Blast and being able to one-shot infantry like that means that these Exocrines do insane damage when they get those targets in their lines of sight. And uh, that's not definitely something I wouldn't discount. I don't think you, you know, are looking for it at any at every situation. But if there is a situation in which your Exocrine could potentially advance sideways inside the Hive Tyrant Aura and get a really juicy shot off, that's definitely something to keep in the back of your head. The Hive Tyrant also is, is very good at buffing the Maliceptors as well. As they're moving up the table, the Hive Tyrant can be in a central position, giving them assault so they're able to then advance uh, onto objectives and still shoot their guns, which is super duper important. 
Now, another thing to keep in mind about the exocrine is its weird body conformation when it comes to measuring line of sight from it. Now, I do have a whole video on terrain and how terrain interacts with line of sight. And if you want some examples on how line of sight works, go check that one out. But the long story short is that you could draw line of sight from your model, any point on your model. And if you have assembled the exocrine uh, per sort of the, the, <laughs> the pictured model that is on the box, you'll find that its gun actually extends a little bit over the edge of its base, between half an inch and an inch, depending on exactly where you set it up. The reason that that is important is that it allows you to, tr to trace your line of sight from past where your base is. If we are on a terrain setup like this, this is from the Leviathan Tournament Companion, oftentimes you'll find that there are these corners of terrain where either uh, the space between ruins is very narrow, or you'll find that there's a space where you can place your model, but you can't fit wholly on this terrain feature to get line of sight through it. So this wall is blocking true line of sight, obviously, because it's big and opaque, and we can't trace our line of sight through these ruins unless we're wholly on top of them. However, the Exocrine has a little bit of an evolutionary advantage in that it has parts of its model that are overextending its, uh, extending over its base that are then not tracing their line of sight through the ruin terrain. So for example, we can sit the, the Exocrine here, and if it, if it was back like this, it wouldn't be able to trace this line of sight or any line of sight like this because the ruin that it's inside, not being wholly within it, would block its own line of sight. However, the Exocrine, because it does extend over a little bit, can place itself like this where the tip of that gun barrel is actually extending over the edge of that terrain. So now any line of sight traced from this is not going to be passing through that ruin, so you can actually control lines of sight that the model would be physically too large to be able to. And this is an advantage that Exocrines have over other similar monster varieties of you know ranged attacker. Uh, the other thing you can do specifically on these Leviathan layouts is actually place the Exocrine like this, where its cannon is overhanging uh, the joint between these two ruins right here, and that allows you to trace your line of sight from the tip of that cannon. And that is something that you will see happen in uh, competitive tournament play, even not even in TTS, this isn't a tabletop simulator only thing. If you have the Exocrine assembled such that its gun protrudes over the, the, top, the tip of its base, you can actually find that it gets a lot of additional lines of sight that you normally wouldn't expect it to. And this can also combo with the Hive Tyrant's ability to make them advance and charge. It gives them a lot of that like lateral control over their where, where their line of sight goes because we can be moving that Exocrine you know, with an advance pretty far and then tracing that line of sight from the tip of its gun to get extended line of sight potentially around corners and things like that, uh, which, which actually makes the Exocrine pretty good at its job. It's a good example of the model design, the model construction sort of fulfilling the role of the Exocrine and supporting itself in that role, which makes it slightly more effective of a ranged attacker. Now, last but certainly Certainly not least is the Pyrovore within this combo. These guys are extremely cheap infantry units. For just a couple points, you get a single model in the unit. They have a strong torrent ranged attack that while it is short range, you're oftentimes trying to attack units that are coming into you to deal with your Maliceptors. So you don't have to move that far to get in range. And you also have effects like the Hive Tyrant's Onslaught Aura to give ranged weapons assault to allow them to advance and shoot, which definitely helps that short threat range. The attack itself is an AP1 twin-linked flamer. It automatically hits, which is great, and especially once you get a plus one to wound effect like the Neurolictor's Aura, you actually can do some significant damage with a couple of these guys. That said, it also removes cover from the enemy that you shoot at for the remainder of the turn. That is a huge deal because Tyranid range attacks tend to be kind of middling AP. So, punching through cover is a problem for them. Now, I've mentioned a unit a couple times in this summary, and I think I'm gonna insert it in here. I actually wasn't sure if I was gonna talk about this guy because he's in a kind of a weird spot in the Codex currently, just based on how the rules have changed since the Codex was released. The Hive Tyrant is an important include in a lot of Tyranid armies for its ability to grant advance and shoot to a large area of the table. This is huge for allowing your slower units like Maliceptors or Zoanthropes to get up the table, get line of sight and range to targets with their short range weapons, or allow units like Exocrines to move laterally along the table and get lines of sight as I've talked about previously. The Hive Tyrant also gives you a little bit of command point economy with 
its Will of the Hive Mind ability. Now, nominally, this allows you to use a stratagem for free on a unit within 12 inches. However, we are using the Autumn Data Slate while recording this video, and that restricts the use of this ability to only battle tactic stratagems that specifically target only friendly units. Now, the reason that this is a little bit weird is that there are a lot of stratagems in the Tyranid Codex that don't interact with this. There's a lot of stratagems that aren't battle tactics, so you can't use them in conjunction with the ability, but also they target enemy models, even if they are battle tactics. And those, at the time of recording, cannot be used in conjunction with the Hive Tyrant's aura, even if they target a Tyranid unit and an enemy unit. Now, that's the way the rules is written, so if you are playing strict rules is written, that is how the game works. However, many events rule that those abilities can still be used in conjunction with the Hive Tyrant's aura. Going to a tournament or playing in a local event, ask your TOs or your community members before you play because they may play it differently. Now, in any case, there are detachments that have a lot of battle tactic stratagems that the Hive Tyrant can use his ability on, and in those situations, he is amazing. In most other situations, he's mostly a battery for a couple extra CP over the course of the game in terms of free stratagems, and also that important advance and charge roll. He's also a pretty decent late game melee fighter, especially if you kid him out with all melee weapons like a Bone Sword and Lash Whip plus two Scything Talents. He comes in with 10 attacks, can be affected by your other melee buffs, and while his strength characteristic is low, he does have twin length on a lot of those attacks and can actually, you know, blow up a tank or some heavy infantry if you really, really need him to. Now, before we wrap up, I do want to talk about the scoring units in the faction. The first one and the most important one being the Biovore. These guys are the offshoot of the Pyrovore that launches spore mines rather than shooting a flamethrower. They have the same profile, but they have a special action they can do that creates a new spore mine unit anywhere wholly within 48 inches of the Biovore. This is important because spore mines are considered units for the purposes of secondary objectives. So the Biovore is able to create new units on the table almost anywhere you want. And if the Biovore is just a couple inches off of your table edge, they're going to be able to shoot that spore mine basically anywhere on the table from even going down the, the lengthwise of the table. They will have range to most of it, which then can score you objectives like engage in all fronts, behind enemy lines, or even potentially perform actions like a cleanse or deploy teleport homers. There are so many objectives in the tactical objectives deck that requires you to place a unit in a particular position, whether it is to perform an action or it's just to have them there. And the Biovore, as long as your opponent isn't screening you out, allows you to score all of them basically automatically. Four mines themselves are useful units to have on the table. They do have an aura that messes up enemy assaults. And so placing spore mines in a position where enemies would want to end assault moves around you can protect you, for, especially from armies like orcs that advance and charge. Yeah, I'll put a spore mine here. So they're, the gimmick with these guys is that they prevent you from advancing and ending within six inches of them. So Wait, that, what? If that unit advances, then you can't go six inches away from the spore mine. That's... Uh, Dumb. That's exact. That's actually extremely funny. It's crazy suits. Yeah, it's very good. It's very good. Ripper Swarms are the other honorable mention here. These guys are OC0 single entity units. You can take for just a couple points a single Ripper Swarm and they naturally deep strike on their data sheet. Just like the Spore Mines, even if you're not controlling objectives with these units, being able to place them around the table is super impactful and a great way to score secondary objective cards. These two units together with the fast high OC units that the faction has elsewhere, like Termagants, Hormagons, or the gargoyles that we talked about in the beginning of this section really cement Tyranids as being one of the most effective secondary objective scoring factions in the game. For just a couple hundred points, you can include enough units in your army that you don't have to worry about any secondary objective scoring whatsoever. And you can then focus the rest of your game plan on scoring primary objectives. While Tyranids will often see the attrition game turn against them because they do have to sort of jump through these hoops to get solid damage output out of their units, they will typically be ahead in points. And the race is to try to beat the Tyranid player before they can defeat you on the scorecard, which not many factions are able to do so. Tyranids will usually end with less of their army remaining than their opponent, but have way more points. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. So with all the important units in the faction broken down, let's take a moment to talk about detachments that Tyranids have available to them, some of the most important combinations within those detachments and units that you should be looking out for if you're trying to construct a list in those detachments. I'm gonna go in sort of general order from the, the most effective detachment 
to the ones that get played less often because they're not as good. Invasion Fleet is the index detachment for the Tyranid faction. This was the detachment that was originally released with the start of the edition and essentially encapsulates in its purest form the classic game plan of the faction. The faction game plan that I talked about in the beginning of the video it basically is exactly how you want to play. You want to have annoying to kill resilient units standing in the center of the table. Those guys are going to use the rapid regeneration stratagem to keep themselves alive for as long as possible while you're scoring your secondary objectives behind them. You can also maintain control of those objectives with infantry by using stratagems like Endless Swarm, all the while shooting away with your pretty efficient ranged attacks. These guys are buffed by the detachment ability, either getting sustained hits against infantry or lethal hits against monsters and vehicles. That's super important because again, Tyranid weapon profiles tend to be relatively mediocre and getting lethal hits is oftentimes equivalent to getting like a plus one to wound effect which uh, is pretty good, especially if you can source rerolls to hit anywhere, so you have a greater chance of scoring those criticals. On top of that, we also have Adrenal Surge, which can cause those special sustain or lethal hit effects to be applied on a 5+, plus rather than just a 6, which is pretty good, even though it is melee only. Now, any of these effects that allow you to critical hit on a 5+, plus really compound once you have any additional critical hit effects added in. So if you have units like Tyranid Warriors with an attached Tyranid Prime, he gives them sustain sustained hits, you can then also be getting lethal hits from the detachment ability and triggering those on a 5 plus with Adrenal Surge. This makes Invasion Fleet incredibly consistent. Their game plan is almost always the same and they have a pretty solid damage output against a wide variety of the field, being able to adapt themselves before the game begins. Moving on, we'll talk about Synaptic Nexus next because it is very similar to Invasion Fleet in a lot of ways. This detachment has an additional focus on synapse creatures and can protect those synapse creatures with reinforced hive node, reducing incoming AP against them by one. This is good for units like the Norn, the Norn Emissary or the Norn Assimilator or Maliceptors, as we talked about before. The detachment also sort of similarly smooths over their damage output with Irresistible Will, giving an aura of rear ones to hit and wound against specific enemy targets. So while you're not generating lethal or sustained hits in this detachment, Attachment, you are getting a greater volume of rerolls, so the effect is kind of similar. On top of that, you also have a little bit more of a synergy with Battleshock texts. You can actually stack an additional minus one leadership from the Dirge Heart of Karis, nine inches away from a Synapse model, although that one is a little bit hard to apply because it is only nine inches and your Synapse characters are usually pretty important. There's already a synergy in this attachment with the Nero Tyrant, which can then give another minus one leadership on Shadow in the Warp. Your opponent starts to fail leadership checks a lot. You can then use Smothering Shadow to do additional mortal wounds to enemies that are failing Battleshock checks, meaning that the Battleshock Matters theme of the faction works even better in this detachment. Again, Invasion Fleet and Synaptic Nexus largely play a similar stable of units and oftentimes will play a very similar game plan. So uh, once you know how to play one of these attachments, the other one will probably come pretty easily to you. Now taking a little bit of a departure, Unending Swarm is the next one we'll talk about. And this one really pulls the focus away from the resilient monsters Two, instead focusing on fast and high volume infantry. This detachment wants you to take a ton of the smaller bugs and get a lot of reactive and aggressive moves out of them. They get a reactive move once they're shot and lose casualties from an enemy ranged attack. Termigants can also reactive move when enemies move around them. So this so this detachment is just scuttling around all over the place. Largely, the game plan for an ending swarm is going to be relatively similar to the other detachments, but you're putting less of an emphasis on the big monstrous characters and more so on the small units. You're not really focusing on Maliceptors or Exocrines quite as much, and instead you're going to be and instead, that frontline role is going to be played by hundreds and hundreds of Termagants and Gargoyles. The detachment does have a lot of synergy with Termagants and Gargoyles. It allows them to advance additional inches. It allows them to advance additional distance with Bounding Advance. It also allows them to be respawned with Unending Waves and get minus one to hit from Teeming Masses. Honestly, the stratagem list for this detachment is incredible. The biggest combo in the detachment is the combination of Swarming Masses with the Turvagon when used on Termagant units. This 
This gives them critical hits on a five plus and sustained one if the unit is 15 models or more. Because the Turvagon has an aura that gives your Termagants lethal hits with their ranged weapons, you can actually have huge units of 20 Termagants that are shooting two times a model, then getting both lethal and critical hits on a five plus. Which, especially if we start to combo with other effects that we talked about, like the Pyrovore to ignore cover or the Exocrine to reroll ones, actually adds a ton of damage to these guys. And especially, again, if your opponent is battle shocked and affected by a Neurolictor aura and all those attacks are at plus one to wound, it actually means that Termagants can actually start to melt pretty high resilience enemy units pretty effectively. Generally speaking, unending swarm lists will start with that Turvagon plus five or six big units of Termagants and a couple units of Gargoyles to disrupt enemy scoring. They'll also typically then take a smattering of the highlight units that we talked about earlier in the video, two to three Neurolictors, Exocrines and Pyrovores, for example, to take up the back line and add some additional damage into the army. The name of the game for controlling objectives in this detachment is layering your threats. The best practice is to put several units on a single objective, and while these units aren't the easiest things in the world to kill, even though you can buff them with auras like the Venomthropes or Zoanthropes to give them invulnerable saves or stealth, you can make them relatively hard, to, but a lot of armies will still be able to punch through all 20 of them. That said, if you can put multiple units on an objective, you can force your opponent to deal with multiple of those units, respawn the ones that they do kill, potentially regenerate the ones that they leave alive with the Turvagon and make it difficult for your opponent to out objective control you in order to submit your primary control. Now, speaking of fast bugs, the next detachment that we are going to talk about is the Vanguard Onslaught. This one focuses on units with the Vanguard Invader keyword, which generally speaking means all the guys with the gribbly tentacle Cthulhu faces and uh, most of the people with wings. This gives all the Vanguard Invaders advance and charge, making it one of the fastest detachments in the Codex. And it's really focused on having an absolutely insane Alpha Strike. Because most of the Vanguard Invaders either have Scout or Infiltrators, these forward operating units are able to start the game up ahead of your army and close to your opponent. They're then fast enough that even if your opponent tries to deploy far back, unless they start really on their table edge, in which case a lot of times they uh, will be too slow to actually come in and contest you on objectives, you'll be able to get them on the first turn if you go first. If you don't win the roll off to go first, the Neuro Node Enhancement allows you to redeploy those units back to safe, so you can deploy them very aggressively without really any risk to yourself. And it means that oftentimes, if you end up going first, the detachment will just blow out your opponent. Units like Gene Stealers, Von Ryan's Leapers, Lictors, the Death Leaper are really the poster children for this kind of game plan. You want to be putting them in aggressive positions, moving them up aggressively, and then redeploying them if things don't go your way. On top of that, the detachment's also able to bring in reserves on the first turn, so a lot of the deep striking units or even just strategic reserves coming off the table edge can further cement that alpha strike or control the middle of the table while your opponent is reeling. Now, that being said, there is still a lot of play within the faction if you don't win the roll off to go first. The surprise assault stratagem is one of the weirdest ones in the game right now. It allows you to force battle shock checks on enemies in exchange for bonuses to hit and wound against them, but it doesn't actually require you to be attacking them and has an unlimited range, meaning that this stratagem can potentially battle shock enemies uh, and anywhere on the table in their own fight phase, which oftentimes can cause them to fail important objectives. Objectives like behind enemy lines or engage in all fronts require your opponent not to be battle shocked, and if they are battle shocked, uh, meaning that if you battle shock them before the end of their turn, that objective won't actually complete, and they'll end up losing victory points. On top of that, the detachment is also able to put its vanguard invader units back into strategic reserve and move them in response to enemy movements near them, which makes them incredibly difficult to pin down. This is probably one of the most technical detachments in the Codex. It's extremely difficult to play well, but if you're including some of those aggressive units like Von Ryan's Leapers and Gene Stillers, we talked about before, it has a very strong alpha strike and then can control the middle of the table, not relying so much on the big heavy monsters, but instead on lone operatives that are incredibly annoying to pin down because they have reactive movements or can't be targeted outside six inches with the unseen lurker stratagem, meaning that they can maintain control of objectives or fight over objectives for a lot longer than your opponent anticipates. You can then back this up with some solid melee units, again, like Gene Stealers or even melee Tyranid Warriors, which get the Vanguard Invader keyword if they have an attached Tyranid Prime. And you can support that with units like Exocrines and Maliceptors to sort of shore up that damage output. Now, moving on to Assimilation Swarm, this is an extremely esoteric detachment. This is 
The Harvester Show, which is a keyword shared by just a couple of units, Horospexes, Psychophages, Ripper Swarms, and Pyrovores. However, it does have some insane buffs for them. Of those, the most exciting Harvesters on the list is the Haruspex. These guys are melee monstrosities. They're relatively tough to kill and have a billion attacks in melee. And Assimilation Swarm ends up being very much the Haruspex show. Assimilation Swarm is kind of following the same game plan that we've talked about previously, but replacing those Maliceptors with Haru Spexes. It also then has a lot of benefits for heavy infantry, units like Zoanthropes or Tyrant Guard that can regenerate multiple times with their detachment roll that allows you to add fully healthy units back into the unit once you're regenerating. With the combination of stratagems and the detachment ability normally, you can regenerate a unit up to three times per round, meaning that these big heavy infantry units, as long as you're not being too aggressive with them and don't get them one shot, can be restocked almost up to full essentially every turn. There's also some benefits for your melee characters as well. The Parasitic Biomorphology Enhancement is incredibly strong on units like Melee Tyranid Warriors or Hive Tyrants, again, attaching to Tyrant Guard. And that ability to regenerate units is also good on the Pyrovores, which you're already taking because they're Harvesters, but also units like Zoanthropes. So a lot of times this detachment is gonna be taking several Haru Spexes to form the front line of the army. Then you're gonna be, then you're gonna be backing that up with units like Tyrant Guard or Zoanthropes that can actually apply some additional damage output. The Haruspexes are difficult to kill. Um, you do have stratagems like a Blade of Carapace that can protect the Haruspexes from damage and then allow them to regenerate their wounds back with the regeneration mechanic. And once they're stuck in melee, stratagems like Secure Biomass make them incredibly dangerous. I wouldn't expect your Haruspexes to get into melee too often because your opponent is highly incentivized to focus all their fire on them and remove them, which they probably will do, but not without an immense amount of effort, enough that you'll probably be able to win out by dominating the primary objectives. This is a really interesting detachment. It is a bit of a stat check. You'll find oftentimes that enemies that are able to one round or one shot your big units will destroy them very quickly because the regeneration mechanic then doesn't come into play. But armies that are not able to actually kill your units wholly will have a really tough time dealing with them and will struggle to get purchase back on primary objectives when being eaten by Paru Spexes. Now that moves us on to the last detachment that Tyranids have access to, the Crusher Stampede. This detachment focuses almost entirely on melee monsters, and at the risk of making this uh, more of a rules review and less of a tactics video, uh, doesn't do it super well. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have any defensive buffs for monsters against enemy shooting, which is generally speaking when you're going to be losing monsters. That said, this detachment does make them incredibly dangerous once they do get to melee. You can do Mortal Wounds with Corrosive Viscera or Massive Impact, get rerolls from Rampaging Monstrosities, and hit or wound penalties against you in melee from Savage Roar. Now, there is a small interaction when it comes to ranged focused monsters. The detachment ability will impact all of your attacks when your monsters are damaged, not only your melee attacks, and they can get a little bit of a buff from swarm guided salvos. But when we're talking about the stratagems and the majority of the focus of this attachment, it is almost entirely on those melee monsters. So while you definitely should be including some ranged stuff to benefit yourself, things like Exocrines and Maliceptors and the units that we've talked about before, those will get generally less of a benefit from the detachment. Now, obviously this detachment basically only affects your monsters. So you wanna be focusing on those melee monsters when constructing an army for it. There's not quite as much interesting technology with this one. You're mostly wanting to put tiered monsters into melee with your opponent. You can back that up with backline shooting and powerful utility units and essentially play the same game plan that other Tyranid detachments have. You're just focused more on melee than the other ones. That's all I really have to say about Crusher Stampede, to be honest. Uh, it's a little bit of a miss when compared to the other detachments. It definitely still has the damage output to compete, especially if you're talking about melee monsters specifically. And with that, this concludes my breakdown of the Tyranid faction. Tyranids are a diverse faction with a deep roster and a wide variety of interesting builds, but a faction that does require careful list building and skillful use on the table to succeed. It was an interesting and I think overall correct choice to include them as one of the starter factions of the game opposite Space Marines, who tend to be more straightforward and individually powerful, whereas Tyranids have to utilize more combo play, whereas Tyranids have to use more maneuvering and combo play to succeed. However, are still relatively straightforward and not 
not too difficult to pick up for a new player. Let me know down in the comment section if you found this video useful and if you'd like me to do similar breakdowns on other facts. Big thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Thanks to VoxLink for sponsoring this video. Thanks as well to everybody who supports the channel either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tacticaltortoise, YouTube channel members, and Twitch subscribers. All you people are great and I love you. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy working.